Welcome to Red May, your one month vacation from capitalism. We are on our ninth event out of 43. We have, my God, over 100 different guest speakers. It just boggles the mind. Let me uh, preview a little of what's up for all those who are waiting to look, uh, listen to autonomy uh, in Turin and Detroit. Uh, so, uh, and it see, the, the, the events seem to line up this week, uh, uh, different angles on a similar topic. We have uh, on uh, Tuesday, May 11th at 11 a.m., class power on zero hours, strategies for the current moment from the Angry Workers Collective. Um, on uh, Wednesday, May 12th at 11 a.m., we have Post Work Horizons with Kathy Weeks. Will Strong, Julian Saravo, and Kate Aronoff. Seems to be a work theme here. On uh, Thursday at 11 a.m., we have Transgender Marxism with uh, Jules Joanne Gleason and Ella Rourke. Uh, and then on Thursday, uh, May 13th at 6 p.m., Thinking with James and Grace Lee Boggs, which of course will not have a lot of resonance with this panel. Uh, we have for that panel, Stephen Ward, Cedric Johnson, Colleen Lai, and Matt Burkhold as the moderator. Uh, on Friday at 11 a.m., COVID, climate, chronic emergency, antinomies of the state with Alberto Toscano, Anselm Jappé, Andreas Malm, and A.J. Singh Chaudhary. And at uh, 6 p.m. that same day, fighting for their own servitude, uh, with Jason Reed, Robin Marasco, Warren Montag, and Assad Haider. So great stuff coming up. Uh, you ask how we are able to put on this fabulous event. We must have ladles of institutional funding to bring in 100 speakers. Well, the secret is we have no institutional funding because an event uh, with a slogan like be a commie for a month doesn't really qualify for institutional funding in America. So we depend on your generosity. You can manifest that generosity on www.redmayseattle.org, which is our website. Uh, we'll give you a button to donate on. You can do either Patreon or GoFundMe. You can go directly to GoFundMe. Uh, Fan the flames of Red May is the uh, uh, code word to get in, or I think, I, there's some information on the YouTube description. So a lot of ways to get in and give us money. Please be generous. But now I wanna start this event uh, by introducing uh, the moderator, Kevin Van Meter. Uh, Kevin, of course, is a Red May alum. who was here, I think, three years ago, maybe, maybe the last, no, the, we, I was gonna say the last time we were live, but we've only been uh, on, uh, uh, Zoom for two years, <laughs> though it feels like an eternity. Uh, Kevin is an organizer and autonomist. He's the author of Guerrillas of Desire, Notes on Everyday Resistance and Organizing to Make a Revolution Possible from AK Press. Uh, and he's uh, uh, about to bring out sometime in the near future, uh, his new book, Reading Struggles, Autonomous Marxism, from Detroit to Turin and back again, which oddly enough is the subject of today's panel. So I turn it over to Kevin who will introduce his fellow panelists. Welcome to Red May again, Kevin. Thank you. And I should probably note that um, I need to find time to write that forthcoming title with all the organizing I'm currently doing uh, amidst this pandemic. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you for having us. So quick little rundown of what I'm going to do. I'm going to provide an introduction to our uh, three esteemed panelists today. I'm also going to provide an introduction to Paul Buell, who was originally scheduled to join us, but due to an emergency wasn't able to. And part of the reason to introduce him and his work is that it's really uh, key to understanding the trajectories and the red threads that we're going to be untangling today. Uh, he's also provided us a statement. Then uh, I'm going to provide a little context for this question we're trying to answer, uh, uh, ask and answer today. Um, 
And then I'm going to uh, conclude with a reading from uh, Jimmy Fox, which I think is an appropriate way of setting up the stage. Then, of course, we'll go through our three panelists, have a little bit of open discussion, take questions from the audience, and then conclude. So appreciate all those who are joining us around the United States and around the world today, and of course, those who are watching here in the future. So on our three esteemed panelists. First up, we have um, uh, Scott. He's a professor at, uh, in the Department of Comparative Race and Ethics Studies at Texas Christus University. He's joining us from Texas today, of course. He is the author of 50 Year Rebellion, How the US Political Crisis Began in Detroit. For me and many others, this is really a guide to understanding uh, the, the history of Detroit, how that has influenced um, radical organizing, and of course, uh, the development of both class struggle and politics across the United States. He is also the, uh, has really the distinction to be a co-author with Grace Lee Boggs of The Next Revolution, Sustainable Activism for the 20th Century. And really, in a lot of ways, that particular title digs deep into the subject matter we're trying to address today. What is the relationship between workers' autonomy and Black struggle? What is the relationship between class struggle and anti-racist organizing? And those are the subjects which clearly um, have affected us, not, not just over this last year or two, but over the last 500 years. So we're really happy to have Scott here and, and joining us on that particular subject matter. Then, of course, we have uh, Nico Pizzolatto, who's joining us uh, in from London. He's the author of Challenging Global Capitalism, labor migration, radical struggle, and urban change in Detroit and Turin. And clearly, that particular title is reflected in our own title today. Uh, Nico's book, um, honestly, was a real uh, eye-opener to me. I based a lot of my own particular work on that title, uh, partially because it really interweaves these circulating struggles that we see Developing Detroit, its racialized elements, the similar relations that took place in Italy, and then of course how Detroit and Turin not only were two major auto capitals, but two major capitals for class struggle. So certainly excited to have Nico here with us. And last not least, of course, is uh, Andrew. Andrew and I had the distinct pleasure of meeting, I think it was about five years ago now, um, and this is appropriate for our story, in the classroom of Cesare Cesarino. Uh, Cesare is one of Antonio Negri's uh, uh, collaborators and protégés. Um, Andrew and I kind of met on a whim there and have uh, stayed in touch since. Uh, Andrew, of course, is one of the editors at uh, Viewpoint, fantastic autonomous journal that everyone should take a peek at. And most recently, the translator and editor of The Weapon of Organization, Mario Tronti's Political Revolution and Marxism. And particularly, I'm excited to see this as someone who does not read Italian uh, and has been dying to read more of Tronti's work for a good 20 years, the recent publication of Workers and Capital, and then, of course, this recent Common Notions title that uh, Andrew has edited and translated is certainly a welcome addition to uh, that material. And of course, I wanna make sure to introduce Paul Buell, who's not with us, but I think plays a really important role in understanding this history. And of course, this question. Uh, his work, of course, uh, has been drawn upon by all four of us and many others. Uh, Paul, first and foremost, uh, was the editor of the Student for Democratic Society's journal, Radical America. And in a lot of ways, that particular publication uh, introduced the American public and the American radical left to uh, developments in Italy, in France in the 60s, uh, developments in the global south, of course. Uh, special issues on CLR James and Black liberation struggle are formulative for understanding the question between workers' autonomy and Black liberation and how those particular struggles emerged and commingled and the like particularly in the 60s and 70s. Uh, Paul's book, Marxism in the United States, is foundational for understanding those Marxian movements of that time. And then of course, he is the authorized biographer of CLR James, The Artist is Revolutionary, which is very key uh, to understanding James, not just in, uh, in context, but of course, the many kind of red threads that develop from James's work. And if I could put a, another plug in for his other book, uh, from 1986, C.L.R. James's Life and Work is a collection that Paul put together that really starts to uh, uh, allow us to understand at that particular time and then since the huge web of uh, ideas and struggles and theorists who've drawn particularly from C.L.R. James. So in a lot of ways, C.L.R. is going to um, begin this conversation. So now that I've provided a bit of an introduction, a little bit more on C.L.R. James since um, 
Paul couldn't join us today. Then of course, I'll read his statement, talk about Jimmy Boggs for a moment, and then we'll move on to our panelists. In 1938 and 1939, CLR James is traveling in the United States. And to use Paul's words um, from the artist and revolutionary, he was summoned by Trotsky to Mexico, where he was currently in exile. And as part of this summoning, and I'm certainly not going to give um, uh, a, a full and robust summary of the complexity of arguments that they engaged in at that time, and then in written form and discussion and debate thereafter, but really the crux of their argument was the quote unquote black question in the United States. CLR James believed that in fact, the self-organization and self-activity of black people in the United States would in fact lead and develop a robust black liberation movement and hence class struggle as well. Trotsky believed drawing upon the Russian example uh, that in fact the party would lead and then uh, guide various quote unquote ethnic minorities in the United States as it had in Russia and hence that the black struggle will be subjugated to the class struggle and then the party. Clearly, if we're gonna take that particular discussion as um, uh, projecting into history itself, uh, CLR has, um, has won that debate, right? The self-activity and self-organization of black liberation struggles that have been ongoing for 500 years in that particular conversation can be projected forward through the, the, not just the 30s, but the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s today, and see the importance of the autonomy of black liberation struggle from the larger class struggle. Additionally, um, and in a number of ways, this particular conversation, as it then reverberates throughout the United States, allows organizers, theorists, um, both uh, engaged in party politics and union organizing, and of course beyond that, to start to grapple with this important and central question. What is the relationship between workers' autonomy and black liberation? And clearly that conversation is ongoing that we're having it now in 2021. And I think it's important to note that that conversation is ongoing and not only the conversation we're having today, um, but also we wanna have this conversation with a little bit of a larger frame. So not only do we want to to, to kind of trace those red threads from CLR James to the present. We wanna trace those red threads through um, the work of uh, Grace and Jimmy Boggs. We wanna trace that work through the League of Revolutionary Black Workers and their Italian counterparts. We wanna trace that through Jimmy Boggs and others, of course, to Mario Tronti. That's one way of approaching this kind of theoretical lineage in these questions. But I think it's also important to look at kind of neighboring conversations. Clearly, if we were just to have a conversation about CLR James and his influences and impact, it not only would fill up this session, but really all the 100 panels of Red May. And those tentacles and those conversations are important to readdress. So this conversation, I want to situate then, of course, within the larger conversation of James's work of Black liberation struggles. We might want to consider how the Kambachi River Collective Statement and other uh, Black feminist contributions not only allow us to rethink these questions, but really enrich them in a substantive way. So certainly look forward to hearing what our panelists have to say. And what I want to do next is just quickly provide um, a reading of what Paul has provided for us. He states, Autonomedia, a few comments. Because a series of problems keep me from taking part in what obviously is a valuable program, he has asked me to read these comments. He says they won't take up much time. Sealer James, Grace Lee Boggs, and others helped generate and very much took part in a loosely allied global movement, at least from the United States to Italy and the United Kingdom. It was a great honor to provide some voice to this movement through Radical America. It made sense of our freshened understanding of Marxism for our own time, and in doing so, made sense of our new left. Mostly campus experiences leading somewhere. The struggles against imperialism and war, the struggles of women and people of color, et cetera, all came together in the formulations that James Boggs and others set forth. One of our breakthroughs at Radical America was the published documents of the struggle alongside any commentary of the usual sort seen in left newspapers. But coming from the struggles directly with the visuals of cartoons with satires and demands that marked this era. In a month, I am to take part 
or not take part, as he says, <laughs> in an international conference on Guy Debord's Society of the Spectacle, translated and printed by Freddie Perlman via the Detroit Press Co-op as a 1970 issue of Radical America. A year later, Radical America had been our bestseller, bringing together satire, peacenik agitation, and marijuana. I mention these because the role of anarchists and quasi-anarchists cannot be ignored, no matter that the coming Marxist Leninism sought to do so, or that visual experimentation, also the lessons of the underground press with a splash of new poetry and lyrical journalism could be absent. In short, it was time of vast creativity of which autonomism was a distinct part, sharing a lot with other parts. CLR often pointed to the role of individual creativity as mandatory to the revolutionary process, and the general recognition of that role was vital. I am really glad that Radical America could document Portugal, Italy, Quebec, Detroit, etc. For everywhere but Detroit, Radical editor Jim Kaplan deserves a lot of credit, although we share tasks and enthusiasms. He has been close to big flame, and that was our British connection. Dan Gergrakis uh, connected us with our comrades in Italy, and of course did fundamental work on the League. How it all fell apart, how fast it fell apart, will be something for discussion, and I'm sure recrimination. Betrayals we found on all sides, especially from the labor bureaucracy, and the slowing of the very spirit of the revolutionary uprising, along with the factory shutdown, had a deadening effect that was objective. A moment came, then passed. Paul Buell. I thank Paul for sharing his reflections and statements uh, for this work today. And before we turn to Scott, Nico, and Andrew, we'll go in that particular order in order to reflect the kind of historical unfoldings that we'll be discussing and this panel reflects. I wanna begin um, with a quote from Jimmy Boggs. This is from the Classless Society out of his American Revolution connection. In fact, this is the final paragraph of that particular work and I think it will um, really draw on the uh, issues we're looking to address. The horizons which the social revolution in America open up are more tremendous than anywhere else in the world. But the path which the revolution will have to take in this country is also more difficult and vicious than anywhere else in the world. First of all, it is the welfare state with its huge forces which has been challenged and second, inside each America from top to bottom in various degrees has been accumulated all the corruption of a class society, which has achieved its magnificent technological progress, first and always the exploitation of the quote unquote Negro race, and then by exploiting the immigrants of all races. At the same time, the class society has constantly encouraged the exploitation to attempt to rise out of their class and themselves become exploiters of their own groupings and finally, of their own people. The struggle to rid themselves and each other of this accumulated corruption is going to be more painful and violent than any struggles over purely economic grievances have been or likely to be. And very clearly, in these amazing yet simple words of Jimmy Boggs, we see the intersection of class and race struggles. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Scott. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Red May, um, for having me, for organizing this session. Um, and thank you really for uh, all the work you do. And thank everyone out there for joining us uh, on a Sunday. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers and people with mothers um, out there. Um, so I'm gonna start by just saying a little bit about how I enter this topic. And really as a disclaimer to make clear, I am not an exhaustive historian um, on this issue. Um, the, the quote um, that you just heard comes out of the book American Revolution, which actually began as a series of debates and ultimately became the split document for the Boggses um, with CLR James and some of the other members of correspondence. Um, and I'm not an expert on that. I mean, what I'm gonna talk about is, is what some of those ideas meant for Jimmy and Grace at the time, how it impacted their work in Detroit and really how it more ultimately affected um, my work with Grace. Um, I met Grace in 1998 um, and I worked with her for 17 years um, until she passed, joined the ancestors in 2015. Um, and when I met Grace in 1998, of course she was, she was well-known in Detroit. Um, she was writing a local column in a predominantly black newspaper, community newspaper. 
Um, but she was almost unknown um, to people working in Asian American studies in my generation. Um, she wasn't known to most of the people I was working with within radical organizing, Marxist organizing at the time. Um, so it really is incredible to think that she went from, you know, relative obscurity and the time I met her to now being routinely, you know, quoted by everyone from, uh, you know, uh, speakers at the Stop Asian Hate rallies all over the country to people in academia. She was tweeted out by Kamala Harris, you know, a little while back. So uh, it, it's just kind of extraordinary. It was extraordinary to grace to see how she had gone from, from again, what, what she would have thought of as, as someone who was, again, was significant with, with her area of work, but, but not much known as a public figure to being becoming what she called a minor celebrity uh, in her lifetime. And I think her, her stature has continued to grow since then. So I'll say a little bit more about why that's significant at the end. Uh, but I'll say, you know, when I was planning this presentation, I was assuming Paul would be <laughs> on the panel because he would bring a lot more expertise to the discussion of, you know, that period of work correspondence of uh, that break between CLR James uh, and, and Jimmy and Grace. Um, and certainly, you know, again, I, I know it more from, from Grace's side of things um, rather than, than CLR James's side of things. Um, Robin Kelly has an essay where he talks about meeting Grace, um, really large measure through, through Paul's organizing of a CLR James conference at Brown University. Ironically, Grace was born in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and that's important. Uh, again, I'm also not an expert on the anti-Stalinist or, or, or Trotskyist um, wing of the left. For Grace, I think it's where she entered the left. To a certain degree, it was where Jimmy entered the left, though, as, as I'll say, actually, he was probably more brought into the movement through, through the CP and, and was kind of a fellow traveler and, and participant in, in some of the youth activities. Um, and so, you know, it really wasn't the central identity um, for Grace to see herself uh, as a Trotskyist. Um, and the interesting thing with Grace is, you know, she was not a historian. She was a philosopher, really. It was Hegel that guided the way she approached ideas and then obviously Marx um, as well. And so, you know, I was trained as a historian and so I'd be much more likely to enter a topic by looking at all the sources and what the different sources have to say and, and going into the archives. And that wasn't Grace. I mean, Grace was interested in the past. She was interested in history, but from very much a presentist view, from very much a, a revolutionary theory view that, that for her, again, very much a Hegel, Hegelian way, certain topics and issues and questions came to the forefront at her at certain moments in history. Um, and, and then, you know, in a lot of ways they receded and, and she became more interested in particular questions. So I remember once asking her, you know, um, when uh, uh, Cedric Robinson's Black Marxism was reissued, I think it was around 2000, I got a copy of the book. I was interested to talk to Grace about it for obvious reasons, you know, that relate to this panel. And she just said, I'm not interested in that book. <laughs> just, when, I, when I looked, when I looked, when I first looked at it, I just thought, no, it's not, it wasn't what, and, and so, you know, it's a similar uh, thing came up when, when people, right, because she was one of the last, um, sort of, certainly the, uh, last survivor of the, the three at the core of the Johnson Forest tendency, if, if you consider her, you know, the, the, the third key member with, with CLR James and Ryan Junior Sky. So people would ask her all kinds of questions, you know, researching different, sorry, I'm doing the hand gestures, <laughs> researching all different aspects of, you know, the internal dynamics in the organization, the splits, the, and, and there were certain questions that just didn't interest her at that moment. And, and she would say, you know, look, what does this mean now at this moment, right? That I took this position, Jimmy and I took the position, CLR took the position, CLR ended up, you know, in Europe, we were in Detroit. That was more interesting to her. Like unless that scholar or that researcher or that radical activist wanted to relate the history of correspondence to what was happening at Detroit in 2003 or 2007. She just didn't really have time for that. I mean, that's, she had, you know, um, so, so Paul would know a lot more. Um, one of my mentors, Robert Hill, who, who was named by CLR James to be a literary executor. Uh, I worked with uh, Bobby at UCLA. Obviously he knew a lot more about some of the details and at a certain point, you know, he was working very closely with Grace and there were other times when Grace said, you know, I, these aren't the questions that most interest me, um, Bobby. Um, and so I, I think that's important to just get a sense of, of what this history meant to Grace. There's a quote in our book, The Next American Revolution, where she says, you know, history is not the past, it's the stories we tell about the past. And I think every historian agrees with that <laughs> in a lot of ways. But for Grace, it went way beyond, I think, the way an, an archival or a scholarly historian 
I take this on. So all that disclaimer to also say, again, I'm also not an expert on autonomous Marxism. You know, I was very much introduced to Marxism by people in the 60s and 70s who were, you know, at the core of the new communist movement, the anti-revisionist movement, who were, you know, reading Lenin um, and Mao, but also still, you know, talking about the Stalin criteria for determining uh, uh, what is a nation and, and, you know, using Stalin's foundation as Leninism to talk about um, cadre organization uh, and party building. Uh, and then when I met Grace, it was when I was sort of in some ways grappling with the contradictions of, of that legacy. Um, but at that point, you know, again, Grace had, she never renounced Marxism, but she had a particular interest in Marx, um, but a particular interest in revolutionary um, theory that, that went beyond Marx. So that's why I, I just, I didn't continue to follow all the twists and turns in Marxism in the same way, though clearly again, you know, um, through Grace and had conversations with some of the other folks, right? At, at the Carve Red Macy, yeah, people like, like people like um, Michael Hart, for instance. Okay, so very brief background for those that, that don't know who Jimmy and Grace were. I assume most people do um, if you're coming to Red May Seattle. But what's significant, uh, particularly to Grace, is that, that they came from very different backgrounds, right? Jimmy came um, from Marion Junction, Alabama, so the rural Jim Crow South. He was part of the great migration of African Americans in the North, particularly working class African Americans, or right? he worked at Chrysler um, for 27 or so years. Um, and his uh, revolutionary theorizing and, and organizing really comes from that background as a black worker, as an organic intellectual. Grace was much more of a formally trained intellectual, even though she never worked in, in academe. Uh, she really couldn't because of the race and gender discrimination in her time. Um, she grew up in New York after being born in Providence. Her father was a Chinese restaurant um, operator. Uh, she got her BA uh, and PhD in philosophy um, in 1940, probably one of the first Asian American women, certainly in the field of philosophy, I think, to get a PhD. And then she was introduced to the movement um, really through her engagement um, with the Workers' Party. And then again, there's all the ins and outs that someone knows better than me of how the Johnson Force tends to James they ally with the Workers' Party, the Socialist Workers' Party. The more important thing consistently is they were um, part of the Johnson Force tendency, right? And it was the Johnson Forest tendency's emphasis on the independent role, you know, of African Americans, women, workers, moving beyond a, a sort of essentialist idea of, of class at the core of Marxism and revolution. That that really led them to people like Jimmy Jimmy Boggs, but also through um, what they called um, the importance of third layer schools, right, where the workers would become the teachers, the workers, the third layer would become the teachers, and the professional revolutionaries, the intellectuals uh, would would become the students. Um, so Jimmy Boggs really stood out in that process. It also stood out to Grace as someone she wanted to um, to see romantically um, as well. They got married in 1953. Um, and then, as I mentioned, correspondence really at the core of their work in Detroit. Grace had moved uh, to Detroit uh, to, to, to help edit correspondence. Um, there were others, again, they worked with like, like Marty Glaberman in, in that, that time. Um, but then really after the break with CLR James, they, Jimmy and Grace become much more public figures through the civil rights and black power movements in Detroit. And obviously as those become you know, national movements that are, that are followed very closely. Um, and then the Detroit Rebellion in 67 becomes a real breaking point in their politics. So all that quick background, quick disclaimer. Um, and then I just want to emphasize, I think, a few things um, at the time I have left about Jimmy and Grace to shape this conversation. So as I mentioned, you know, um, Grace was very much uh, a Marxist through her early reading of Marx, right? The, the Marxist humanist element that really comes through um, in, in Johnson Forrest and correspondence work. She uh, really, to the day she died, was, was a student of Hegel. I mean, Hegel's concept of dialectics was at the core of really all her thinking. You know, I was taught through kind of the Marxist on this framework that Marx turned Hegel upside down and that material materialism, you know, uh, was more important than idealism, but that wasn't the case for Grace. Grace was very much an idealist. Um, not that she didn't care about, you know, material <clears throat> issues, but she was not a dialectical materialist, right? This was something that, that was very much central to the way um, she, she and Jimmy approached um, revolutionary theory. As I mentioned, although they were, you know, 
generally part of the Trotskyist uh, wing of the left or Trotskyist tendencies, they really weren't committed Trotskyists as much as they were, uh, particularly for Grace, I think, um, steeped in uh, not the anti-communist left, but the sort of non-communist um, left, right? Um, they had interactions with the CPUSA, but they, they did not follow along the, the particular, I think, um, uh, tendencies of the CPUSA or the, or the communists as, as their work evolved. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, Grace was one of the first to, to translate um, the early writings of Marx, the economic philosophic manuscripts, and that pretty much stayed with her, I think, the rest of her life. Um, here's a quote from our book, um, and this goes back again to her work with, with C.L.R. James and Ryan Janevskaya. Marx's materialism was not the materialism of consumerism, it was the materialism of rooting your ideas in real life and practice, going beyond talk and ideas alone. For example, Marx criticized Hegel for grappling only with theoretical labor and neglecting practical life-sustaining labor. And he criticized the philosopher Feuerbach for rooting ideas too much in nature and not enough in practice and in politics. When you read Marx, or Jesus, parenthetically, um, this way, you come to see that real wealth is not material wealth and real poverty is not just the lack of food, shelter, and clothing. Real poverty is the belief that the purpose of life is acquiring wealth and owning things. Real wealth is the possession of property, uh, is not the possession of property, but the recognition that our deepest need as human beings is to keep developing our natural and acquired powers and to relate to other human beings, right? So I think this is what really stands out for a lot of people looking at Grace today. She's not doing this objective analysis of classes and determining why one set of social forces will be the catalyst of revolution. For her, it's very much a philosophical question of what kind of leap do we need to make uh, as, as human beings to overcome um, the oppression. And that's why for a lot of ways, you know, at, at a certain point, Grace really privileged the role of, of intellectuals, always recognizing the value of organic intellectuals, but never discounting even the role of so-called professional intellectuals. So she had, you know, no patience for, for much of the academic world because <laughs> she didn't see it living up to that standard. Um, now, Jimmy, from his experience in the plant, his radicalism was, again, was a little bit closer tied to some of the work of the, of the CP, um, while he was also very critical of, of the CP. Um, and in many ways, all of the left tendencies. Um, notice he, he allies with a left tendency that really privileges the role of a worker like him in being an intellectual, right, and being a theorist. Of course, Jimmy was very critical of the racism and the business unionism, unionism of the UAW. That's what will lead um, folks like, like Drum later on um, uh, and, and the League uh, to his writings and to his work and, and to him, to, to their house. Um, we're working right now to preserve their house as a museum, as a space, not only where they live, where so much of movement organizing and movement figures um, came through. So another quote from the American Revolution I pulled out um, really emphasizes how Jimmy's analysis of automation, which really comes first from his experience in the plant in conjunction with the reading he, he and Grace are doing at the time. Automation is the stage of production that carries the contradictions of capitalism to their furthest extreme creating and sharpening inside capitalist, inside capitalist society, the conflicts, antagonism, and clashes between people that make for social progress and the inevitable struggle that goes with it. The fact has to be faced. Automation is the greatest revolution that has taken place in human society since men stopped hunting and fishing and started to grow their own food. It is capable of displacing as many productive workers from the workforce as have been brought into the workforce since the invention of the automobile at the beginning of the century. Right? So to the degree they were working the historical materialist tradition, it was not that there's, it was that there's a new group of forces that Jimmy called the outsiders that now would be the focus of revolutionary movement building. So particularly they, they in many ways anticipated the black power movement. They worked through groups like the Freedom Now Party um, you know, and eventually these discussions of what the fate of the so-called underclass and, and these concerns about mass incarceration, right? In many ways, Jimmy's emphasis on automation producing this, this new class of permanent outsiders was really essential to that. Um, I have one more quote here about how they went beyond um, dialectic materials, but I'm going to just skip that for now uh, and point out that they developed an argument that the primary contradiction is between economic and technological overdevelopment and political underdevelopment, which in a lot of ways uh, anticipates the ecological crisis. So while others are debating, you know, the traditional role of the working class 
uh, the relationship between race and class, or you know, um, with with Wallerstein's work, for instance, the the contradiction between the core and the periphery, you know, the global north and the global south, they take this very different approach, right, to understanding uh, uh, the central contradiction between capitalism between this economic technological overdevelopment and this really subjective force that needs to take its place politically. Um, and so, in the third world, the question arose, right, in that era of, of Bandung. Can you skip the stage of bourgeois revolution and go straight from feudalism to socialism, right? And these were really central to the debates of the, the US left, the anti-revisionist movement. Um, for the Boggses, writing and strategizing from the US, this became more pronounced, uh, uh, I'm sorry, they effectively argued for skipping the stage of socialism and going straight to communism, right? Um, well, they never used that phrase, this is sort of my phrase. This became more pronounced as Detroit's industry collapsed, as white people fled to the suburbs um, and eventually middle-class black folk followed, creating a huge swath of abandoned buildings and vacant lots. Uh, and this became really more pronounced after the 1967 rebellion, when the Boxes talked about the importance for them and for all radicals in making a distinction between a rebellion and a revolution that had to go beyond naming the enemy, right? And organizing and agitating against the ruling class uh, and emphasizing this two-sided trans transformation, changing yourself to change the world. Um, and this is where they come up with, with pamphlets like a job ain't the answer, crime among her people. What are the ways, this is where the sort of emphasis on self-organization comes in. Um, because again, it wasn't simply about amassing the forces, whether through voting or our, our armed struggle to overthrow uh, the bourgeoisie or seize state power. It was really about creating the cultural revolution before seizing state power, right? Um, focusing on Gramsci's war position very much in a way that that emphasized the role of African Americans. But increasingly, you know, they recognized um, in Detroit, particularly as as you have a black political class that takes power and new contradictions arise, that 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 the revolution had to go beyond their emphasis they had placed in the sixties and seventies, both on the Vanguard Party um, and on the black movement kind of worried that I'm maybe out of time. So I'm just gonna stop there, I have to save some other points for later on that go more uh, uh, into the more recent history of Detroit. Wonderful, thank you, Scott. Nico. Hello, hi. Um, I, I was just uh, very engrossed in, in, in the story that Scott was, was um, telling us. Um, well, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's, it's great to be here and, uh, in, and a, a very fascinating uh, understanding the work that all of you are doing. Um, it's, it's also interesting for me to, to revisit um, my work on, on, on Detroit and, and Turin. Uh, that now I'm just thinking it's, it's, it's been now 20 years since I think I, I, I arrived for the first time in Detroit. I, was, I think it was 2001 or maybe 2000. And um, I met Marty Glaberman, uh, who obviously was part of the group at the time. Um, and uh, entering his flat, he, he, I think he, he gave me a bag of pamphlets uh, from that period. And, and we had a, a conversation and now thinking back um, from my point of view, probably very, very naive. Uh, but um, I, I'm very curious to know what you, Kevin, will, um, see you know uh 20 years later uh with after we know so much more about uh the, the black revolutions in detroit and from the point of view of of now as opposed to the point of view uh that that i that i was you know carrying with me when i when i went there um so um what I uh, what I wanted to talk about is this about this idea of uh, connecting and, and contrasting and, and comparing Detroit uh, and Turin, which was I was con concerned about uh, in, in my work, which you which you mentioned very, very kindly. Uh, and it's a work that connects those two places during the kind of climax of Fordism, but really just before uh, we observe that, you know, this kind of rapid decline of Fordism from the kind of early 70s onwards. And in that work, I look at the factories that became the birthplace of a new political praxis, which mixed Marxist social theory with something new. Uh, and, and that something new was, I think, very important. And, and, and we, I think we, this is part of what we are going to talk about today. 
Um, and it came from this energy and initiative, a sort of a novel demograph demographic of industrial workers in the 40s factories. Uh, in the US, African-Americans, in Italy, Southern migrants, uh, Southern Italian migrants. Well, what was new about these workers? Well, not the fact that they were workers. Uh, African-Americans had always had a central place, you know, obviously in, in the American working class and, and so had, you know, Southern Italian in, in the Italian working class and also obviously internationally as they migrated elsewhere. What was not new really in the, in the mid 1960s was that these uh, um, migrants were entering really the, the temples of Fordism. They were not anymore in a sort of in a kind of marginal industries, uh, um, uh, but, they, but they entered the automobile factories, you know, the most productive, the most innovative, the most um, profitable, the leading sector of, of, of the economy. And where people really aspire to work because the jobs you know, were, were paid, stable, were unionized uh, jobs. And these new workers, they brought the industry down to its knees very quickly, you know, in, in, a, few, in a few years. And if you want to, uh, I mean, that's a really a, an exercise in kind of fanta history or fanta, fanta science, science history. Uh, if you want to imagine like um, the a kind of contemporary equivalent or what this meant back then, you would have to imagine the most kind of downtrodden, exploited workers entering Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, and bringing those companies down. You know, shut, shutting those companies. Obviously, uh, you know that it, this won't be able to happen the same way as capitalism is different structured. But just to imagine the political impact of it. So, uh, focusing on, focusing on this kind of connection or contrasting between Detroit and Turin. One first uh, axis of connection, uh, I think, would be about uh, the political impact of this rearticulation of power between workers, companies, and organized labor. So, just to go back to this change, demographic change that you have in the factories in the from the mid 1960s uh, onwards, um, these workers uh, enter these factories in Detroit and Turin, some key factories that are central to the industry. And in, and in turn, the industry is central to the whole economy to work. You know, so imagine how, how uh, the position, the, you know, the, the position, the power that is in that uh, position in, you know, in, the, in the capitalist system. And, and, and I think uh, one thing about the people we're talking about is that they very quickly realize the, 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 the potential of that, of that power. And when you look at this um, change from the point of view of the old guard, those institutions that were thinking of themselves as the legitimate representative of the working class, for you know, the unions in Detroit, the UAW, or in Italy, it would be uh, the Communist Party or the Communist Union, the CGL. Well, you know, you probably think of yeah, very different entities, the UAW in you know in, in Detroit and the Communist Party in Turin. But I, I think what was comparable about them is that well, first they thought of themselves as, as the legitimate representative of the workers, but also they had uh, um, um, a focus on on productivity in a way. You know, so you, so the union was in in, in fact trading uh, more productivity, more workers' productivity for, uh, for better kind of uh, wages and, and, and benefits and so on. Um, in Italy, it was a bit different, but still the, uh, the Communist Party had a sort of uh, creed of productivity. It was a sort of ontological view of who is the industrial worker, you know, what is the factory? And they thought that the factory was a compact of productive workers. Um, they had uh, this kind of nostalgic throwback to the idea of you know, productive workers being able to control with their craft, with their skill, the production process. Obviously, this wasn't anymore the case by, by, uh, by the 60s. But it was very much a, a very exclusionary form of vision of what factory work was. And it was exclusionary towards these new political subjectivities that, who were entering the factories. And imagine the shock when they found out that these new factory workers 
the southern migrants uh, wanted to work less or even you know, not at all, or they didn't like work, or they didn't found, uh, find that pride uh, in, in, in work. So um, these institutions and these new workers had a very different political language. I couldn't understand each other. They have a very, some, maybe you could say a, a, a different language to cool, you know, like as black workers bring the black vernacular in the factory, you know, Southern migrants need to have their own um, dialect and, and so on. Uh, but what, what happens is, is that uh, this leads to a, a breakdown of that kind of balance of industrial relations on which Fordism was based. It was a very fragile balance. You know, I never bought the idea that there was this kind of agreement between you know, uh, uh, manufacturers and organized labor, which made Fordism stable. It was a very fragile balance, which was really upset by these new political actors. And so one thing of, of this connection that maybe has a resonance for today is um, how workers reappropriate strikes as a political tool in Detroit and Turin. And they strike for reasons which are linked to the workplace, but also strike for reasons that go beyond the workplace. Um, they strike against the overall system of, of power relations. They strike because they feel degraded or discriminated or or ill house or underpaid um, or super exploited. Uh, but uh, very importantly, they, they put back the strike as a disruptive element of production. Now, obviously strikes are always a disruptive element of production, but these strikes were, 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 were sudden, you know, were unregulated, were unpredictable. Uh, uh, they, they have a, um, unpredictable spatial extension. They, 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 they're contagious. They move from one department to another, from one factory to another. And if you think of the strike of July 1968, which was one of those organized by, by DRAM in Detroit, uh, uh, that has a lot of resonance in the, you know, in the, in the city uh, news and public opinion. And, and quickly, in a matter of weeks, you have uh, half a dozen other revolutionary groups springing in other factories and, and you know, initiating their own, their own strike. Uh, so um, I think that's, that's one thing because it, this is a kind of strikes that uh, um, factory managers cannot plan for, you know, strikes that capitalism cannot plan for. The other uh, thing that I, I think we can, um, the other axis of connection uh, would be probably this kind of radical critique of social societal hierarchies. Not only the ones in the factories, but, but uh, much beyond the factory. But importantly, this critique of hierarchy society is elaborated through the critique of Fordism, through the critique of what happens at the point of production. So obviously in Detroit, the, the, the protest there is at, at the intersection of questions of race and class that go much beyond uh, the shop floor and you know, the touch on the on the on, on, on the structure of racial capitalism in the US. Uh, it includes you know, other institutions like schools or, or, or prisons and so on. Um, in Italy also the, the, the struggle is interlinked with the, the you know bringing down the hierarchies in, in the universities, in the in the household, even you know later with the feminist. Uh, which are linked to the autonomous markets uh, in the in the um, in the medical profession, in, in, the, in the psychiatric system, in, even in the, even in the military becomes a, a, um, an area of, of struggle. I, I'm just, I'm not sure whether this this maybe has a little bit of resonance in the U.S. with the anti-war uh, movement, I guess. Um, so uh, one could look at all the kind of theoretical and political discourses that are born in both places in terms of how this um, um, bringing down the hierarchies in our, is, is justified. Um, so um, in Turin, really the workers movement is at the center of all these other struggles. But also in Detroit, I think you could say that what happens uh, in, you know, with the legal revolution in black workers you can see there the confluence of the African-American freedom struggle in, in several strands of it, civil rights, black power, uh, black women's battle for welfare rights, 
and then but also the anti-imperialist movement and, and so on. So in both cases, uh, in different ways, these are workers' movements that contain multitudes of other movements. That's the other point that I wanted to, to make. And then the last thing I want to say, <laughs> and um, I think is something that uh, um, many on, on this panel would probably find a fascinating aspect of it is the, um, the individual connection, you know, this network of you know, what I call in an article transnational radicals, uh, how these ideas about self-activity or about autonomy, if you want to call it that way, are developed, are molded in an, an international network of, of individuals who, uh, who, also, who are corresponding with each other, translate each, other, each other's texts. They, they travel you know, to a certain extent, um, especially over the course of maybe 10 years from the mid 60s to the mid um, 70s. And I haven't yet done myself a, a, a full um, mapping of it. And, and it would be very interesting to, to do so, but there are a number of names which uh, are probably familiar to 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 um, some of you, you know, from the Italian side, uh, um, uh, Ferruccio Gambino, Bruno Cartosio, Paolo Carpignano, Roberto Giamanco, later on Christian Marazzi. They all traveled to the U.S. or North America in different uh, moments, and some of them Americans who come to um, to Italy are George Rowick, uh, Dan Georgiakas, John Watson of, of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, and James and, Gre James and Grace Lee Boggs at a certain point uh, as well. And I think you have, would have to put here also uh, the network with France and England, which is also important. It's not only an Italian-US connection. Uh, but so what they, what they share is this kind of common broad understanding of workers as a sort of self-starting self political agents. They shape organized labor rather than being shaped uh, by it. They act outside and often against organized labor. Um, and I think also they share a sort of um, reading of Marx as an instrument of, of analysis. And you were mentioning, Scott, uh, how Grace Lee Boggs had this um, mindset of kind of in, interrogating history from the present, interrogating history from the point of view of organizing now and 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 you know the, the territory as it is as it is uh, now. Um, and I think this was a, a quite a, a common um, in different way it was a, a, a common flavor of this of this group, which, by the way, in Italy contrasted very much with the approach of the Communist Party, which was traditionally to provide a certain historiographical reading of, of Marxist thought and can stick, stick by it as a sort of, a kind of very dogmatic way. So I will stop here and, uh, with this kind of three types of connection between Detroit and Turin and looking forward to, you know, to uh, also what Andrew has to say about this and the kind of conversation later on. Wow, thank you, Nico. Andrew. Great. <clears throat> thank you, Nico, Scott, Kevin, Phil, Sean, Malav, everyone at Red May. Um, it's been really uh, wonderful to, to join again this year and, um, and to hear um, also Paul Buell's comments. I'm sorry again that he wasn't able to join us, but I know we're all sending him our best wishes. Um, his work has been really you know, foundational for many of us trying to trace and explore um, the networks and pathways that, that Nico was just mentioning, especially. Um, so I, I'll say a little bit about where I come in to this conversation and then um, something about the present moment. Um, I, uh, I've been thinking about the relationship between operaismo, uh, Italian workerism, uh, principally through Mario Tronti's work of the 1960s. And I've been trying to relate it to anti-racist and anti-capitalist struggles, mostly in the contemporary United States, because that's where I am. Um, and of course, you know, there are innumerable threads that, um, that can be traced from the operaisti of the 1960s. Uh, and, and many people are doing really exciting work in different, uh, in different areas. One, one thing that for me is really important um, for, for a 21st century um, Marxist or communist approach 
to um, you know, to some of these questions is thinking about abolition, right? Thinking about the abolition of police, the abolition of prisons, but also the abolition of capitalists, of capital, the capitalist state, capitalist society. And even as I'm sure James and Grace Lee Boggs would, would uh, affirm to abolish labor and the working class itself, right? So um, one of the things I've been trying to do is think about what uh, some of, especially Tronti's uh, theoretical frameworks from the sixties might offer uh, us today to, to think about 21st century struggles around abolition. Um, and of course, this is never an immediate uh, correspondence or transposition, right? We have 50 years of developments, thousands of miles of travel. Um, you know, there, I think actually the question of translation is really important uh, for us to theorize and think about a little bit. Um, Scott, you were mentioning Grace Lee Boggs uh, and her translation of the economic philosophical manuscripts, right? That was a sort of apprenticeship in Marxism that she carried out. Uh, Tronti, for his part in the early 60s, was translating unpublished works by Marx. Sergio Bologna was translating Georg Lukács. Um, so I think, you know, I think that this sort of mode of thinking is one that, um, that maybe deserves a little bit more theorization um, today. And I, you know, people like Sandra Metzadra and Brett Nielsen have done this thinking about Gramsci's use of the term translation as, as a ferrying across between time and space, translating Leninist concepts into a new idiom, right? An Italian context uh, when they're, when, you know, in Gramsci's case. Um, and of course, one key translator who, well, I, I shouldn't say of course, but a key translator in this network who uh, is very little talked about in the United States is Danilo Montaldi, who was a sort of heterodox, you know, quasi sociologist working in the Po Valley, who was very influential on Romano Alquati uh, and others uh, in the, the sort of workerist milieu, but who was sort of, um, you know, outside of it. Um, and he was in fact, the one who translated first uh, Paul Romano and Rhea Stone, Grace Lee Boggs's American worker into Italian, right? In a, a series of dispatches and journals. And he was bringing that from the French, um, from socialism or barbarism, socialisme ou barbarie. I don't pronounce French well, I apologize. But uh, so I think the French connection to, sorry, to use that phrase is also really important for us to, um, to think about. And, and going back to some of Scott's questions about, um, about anti-Stalinism and about the sort of um, Stalinist sort of problematic. I think, I think Castoriadis uh, has made some really interesting you know, propositions in that regard that we might wanna, wanna think about too. But anyway, I'm getting a bit sidetracked. Um, what, I, what I would like to talk about uh, is the relationship between abolitionism and reformism. And this is not something that maybe five years ago we thought we would be talking about today. You know, after four years of Trump, it's really surprising that we find ourselves again talking about the problems of reformism, right? Um, of course, this was central to the workerists and also central to, um, to many militants in Detroit who were dealing with a sort of, with the UAW, um, uh, Walter Ruther and, you know, sort of, this like cutting edge of, of liberalism in some ways, right? Aligned with the war on poverty, aligned with the Johnson and Kennedy administrations and various efforts. Um, but so they were struggling against their own form of reformism then. And I think that, you know, activists today who are committed to abolition are, are struggling with, with reformism of a new type, right? Um, you know, if the capitalist state seemed as though it was in a, a very straightforward death spiral just a couple months or years ago, um, incapable of any sort of planning, right, for, for even short-term survival. Today, you know, under a Biden presidency with stimulus and infrastructure and climate regulations, uh, you know, however woefully inadequate, right, I'm, I'm bracketing this, right, however um, extremely inadequate these are, or however ideologically, you know, sort of obfuscating they are, uh, nevertheless, reform is, again, part of the mainstream conversation. It's part of, um, of, of, of the sort of complex that radicals confront, and especially when it comes to um, police and prisons, right? After the George Floyd rebellions of the summer of 2020, abolition is, is, has been mainstreamed in a way, but police reform is by far um, the more um, sort of, um, you know, uh, widespread notion that's, that's crisscrossing the media and, and sort of uh, dinner tables across the country. Uh, and I think that, you know, there's different ways to criticize reformism. Um, you know, there's, there's a classical way of saying it doesn't go far enough. It can be co-opted. 
Um, but I'm interested in thinking about Tronti's conception of reformism uh, and seeing if it has anything to offer us thinking about abolition and, and other struggles today. Um, and, you know, I guess to take a step back and talk a little bit more about Mario Tronti for those who might not be extremely familiar, he's a Marxist philosopher and politician whose work in the early 1960s uh, through journals like Quaderni Rossi and Classe Operaia was uh, very influential on an entire generation of, of militants on the left, both uh, extra parliamentary groups outside of um, kind of mainstream Italian left politics, but also um, he worked within the Communist Party, especially from the late 60s onward, and, um, and had his own sort of impacts there. But Tronti's um, political perspective was one of uncompromising struggle on the side of the working class, right? Um, he says at one point, the important thing is to be uh, Marxist militants in the rough sense, right? You know, and I think that when you take this perspective and you ask, what would it mean to struggle on the side of the working class, very broadly conceived for us now, right? Whereas for Tronti, I think it was a much more narrow conception of industrial workers in, in Turin and elsewhere. Um, for us, I think the question of, of struggling on the working class side today against reformism, what does that mean? Well, it, it must potentially mean, can a revolutionary use be made of reformism? Right? Given that reformism is part of our conjuncture, given that, um, you know, um, given that this is part of the terrain we enter into, uh, can, can a use be made of this, right? And I'm thinking especially about environmental reformism. I'm thinking about uh, ecological struggles and the bearing they may or may not be having upon the state seeking to curb emissions or, or curb uh, fossil fuel uh, permitting and things like that. Um, clearly, this is not uh, a revolutionary ecological anti-capitalism that we're seeing, but can, can some use be made of this? And, and what would that even mean? Um, so for Tronti, um, the reformism kind of problem uh, was in some ways kind of rooted in a very particular context, right? Nico already talked about this a bit, but, you know, we have uh, trade unions that are in some ways, you know, from the perspective of the workerists, part of this sort of conveyor belt of, of workers' demands to the capitalists um, that actually, in fact, produce a sort of development of capital, right? That lead to innovation, that lead to increased accumulation and increased exploitation, um, as well as providing higher wages to workers, which then fuels uh, capitalist development uh, more broadly. It doesn't mean that those struggles are unjust. It just means that the, the trade unions functioned as a sort of piece of the reformist operation. And then the other element was capitalist planning, was the sort of center left um, initiatives under Aldo Moro, the Christian Democrats, who made some overtures to the Italian Socialist Party and other smaller parties uh, to try to have a sort of far-sighted vision of uh, balancing development in Italy and essentially avoiding strikes. Um, right, routinizing bargaining, um, building it into the sort of uh, annual calendar and, um, and, and avoiding um, the refusal of work, which, um, you know, as a sort of watchword, it emerges later, um, but, but refusal being a way that, that working class self-activity can halt the production and reproduction of capital and perhaps the working class, um, well, of labor power, I should say. Uh, the reproduction of the working class would be a different conversation. But, um, but you know, even, even though this is sort of rooted in this particular historical context, even though it's rooted in a, an industrial factory setting in, in Turin and elsewhere, you know, Tronti is really clear even at this early stage, like in, in 1963, he writes this article called The Two Reformisms, which I've translated and, and presented in, in my book with Common Notions, uh, where he really, you know, this was in an article not in one of the the journals most of us are most familiar with, Quaderni Rossi or Classe Operaia, this was in Cronache Operaia, which was uh, more of a sort of leaflet approach that was more directly meant for workers, shorter articles, uh, a bit you know, punchier and more um, polemical in some ways, although actually you know, there's polemics across the board, of course. But in this article, what, what Tronti says, and uh, he, he you know, reformulates this a few ways, but in my translation, what he says is that what is decisive in any of these struggles is not the fact that the capitalists 
can co-opt it later or might be able to benefit it from it later. What is decisive is the anti-capitalist sense objectively assumed by the struggle itself, from whatever point it explodes and from whatever demand it begins. And I think that this, you know, if you'll allow me to sort of leap around, this makes a bridge to um, the struggle for abolition and, the, and various struggles outside of the workplace that in, um, you know, not only in recent years, of course, but especially in recent years have assumed a, a really sort of striking lead uh, when we think about anti-capitalist struggle, right? I'm thinking about the rebellions and riots uh, of last summer uh, against police violence. I'm also thinking about the struggle against the Dakota Access Pipeline, um, indigenous-led struggles um, opposed to fossil fuel uh, extraction and infrastructure development, right? So I think, um, you know, even though again, Tranti is rooted in this, in this particular industrial setting, his perspective is one that I think has traveled to our present in, for those of us who are interested in a less dogmatic version of Marxism, a, a Marxism uh, rooted in, in kind of the subjective movements of the working class broadly conceived, rather than a sort of objective sociological categorization of who's most, um, who's at the nerve center, right? Who, 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 if they pull the switch, can really shut the whole thing down in one go. Uh, not that that question is unimportant, but uh, focusing on, on the struggles themselves and where they explode and building from there, I think is a sort of lesson uh, that, that we can take from many, but, um, but you know, for me in reading Tranti, I, I see it there loud and clear. And I think that it's helpful for us uh, thinking today about, about abolition. Um, so some questions I have, and, and again, these um, might take us far afield. There were so many, so many rich comments um, in, in Nico and, and Scott's presentations that that I would love to like kind of just jump around. Maybe we can do that in a minute with conversation, but, but things that I wanna put on the table because I think they have bearing for whether we think um, some, of the, some of the workerist precepts are still useful today. You know, Tranti argues again in the early to mid sixties that capital needs some of these struggles, right? It needs workers struggles to propel its own development. That's how capitalist development happens. Um, you know, something I'm interested in asking today is whether the state, whether we can make a sort of an analogy uh, and does the capitalist state need struggles around, for example, uh, an ecology, right, and environmentalism, right? Does the long-term existence of capital uh, require, uh, if we can use that word, some of these struggles uh, precisely in order to fuel its own reform efforts, precisely in order for the state to secure its own long-term growth and, and reach? Um, you know, I'm not prepared to say that it is required, but I think it's it's something that we can think about, right? Obviously, reforms are fought tooth and nail when it comes to police and and um, and various incarceration schemes, right? Whatever reforms have been won um, by by the uh, you know movements for abolition, uh, those were those were you know in no way kind of handed out by a corporate liberal state. I think Nico was was maybe gesturing to this that there was no sort of like grand compromise in the '60s that that um, that the unions and the capitalists were sort of in, in clear um, kind of agreement around at all times. Uh, many, of, many of the sort of victories in, in whatever sort of welfare state we might have, you know, I, don't, I don't know if that term is useful in the United States, I don't know if it's applicable, whatever um, you know, sort of provisions for, for public welfare there are, uh, do need to be seen as the fruit of worker struggles, not only as um, you know, sort of um, crumbs to buy us all off, and I think that that's, you know, that's important to keep in mind when we're thinking about um, you know, what kinds of reforms might be on the table, what kinds of um, reforms open up more space for the political growth of the movement. Um, you know, there's different terms that people are using and maybe we can talk about those. But, um, but anyway, to, to just get back to, again, to abolitionism, if, if police reforms, as many scholars uh, have been noting lately, scholars and activists have been noting lately, if you know, reforming the police has actually just meant more money for police, more training, and uh, more and more involvement of police in everybody's daily lives, um, and, and murdering uh, of Black Americans, uh, policing uh, of the southern border, especially in brutal ways, and putting kids in cages. Um, if, if you know, reform has sort of produced this growth of the, of the repressive state apparatus, um, what tips this towards abolition? What, what kind of um, relationship uh, between um, Marxism or, or autonomous Marxism uh, and 
and the sort of ongoing growth of the state via reformism, what, what kind of relationship could contribute to something like a revolution, right? Um, I think we're all interested in this question, even if it seems far away at times. But, you know, last summer, if anything, taught us all that, um, you know, that, that, that struggle really it grows in leaps and bounds in ways that um, I think somebody, perhaps Scott, or maybe it was Nico, mentioned the notion of a leap. I mean, last summer was quite a leap in terms of the, the you know, the kind of um, antagonism and intransigence of, of a mass movement against police and prisons in this country. And I think, you know, two, three years ago, few of us might have guessed um, at the sort of um, the breadth and scale that, that we would have seen. So uh, I know that this has been sort of, you know, jumping around, mentioning a few different um, places and, and, and time periods. Um, and I apologize for not being as lucid and focused as some of the previous speakers, but in the, in the interest of bringing us to some, some extremely present concerns and, and you know, maybe in honor uh, of grace, um, you know, having this sort of presentism, asking not only like who split from who, when, why, but what does that mean for us now, right? Uh, why are we talking about um, these, these currents uh, 50 years later and, and how might they speak to the present um, as well as how are they complicated by our present? Uh, I think is really important. So, um, so yeah, I'll, I'll you know, yield my time to conversation and thanks again for, for Kevin for bringing us together. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you to Nico and Scott as well. And of course, all those listening and those sending along questions. So I have a couple of quick prompts, especially drawn out of the commentary that the panelists have made. And then what we'll do is we'll move to the more uh, specific questions that are either directed toward uh, particular speakers or to uh, political questions we're trying to grapple with. And I think I definitely want to second and third uh, Andrew uh, commenting and uh, noting grace there in regards what does this mean to now and there's certainly a um, tendency among the theorists and individuals we're talking about today to continually focus on that and kind of reject some of these well I don't have time to discuss these historical questions I'm so focused on the ongoing struggle and I think um, that's a, a tension that I always come to uh, in thinking about organizing revolutionary politics today and how can I um, really in in their spirit continue to ask that important question. So I think that's where we want to end up and we want to move into that um, as so well noted by uh, our panelists today. I do want to revisit uh, two particular things before we jump into that question. And that is, um, uh, it is now the 20th anniversary of um, Antonio Negri and Michael Hart's uh, book Empire. In a lot of ways, those of us who were involved in the anti-globalization movement or came afterward uh, see that intervention uh, here in the United States as uh, an introduction of Italian autonomous ideas into the American current. Um, I certainly at the time, uh, even though um, comrades such as Celia Federici were quick to remind me that these ideas in a lot of ways uh, developed in here in Detroit among black liberation struggles. And of course, in my early commentary opening this session with the conversation between Cyril R. James and, um, and Trotsky in 1939, in April of that year, in fact. So I wanna begin with is uh, these concepts of workers autonomy of self activity and the like that we're talking about are clearly indebted to the black liberation struggle. Uh, those of us who encountered empire now 20 years ago and various ideas of autonomous Marxism since um, very often uh, have been remiss in addressing the fundamental questions of black liberation and black struggle. Uh, and as I mentioned, Silvia Federici appropriate uh, today and every day, of course, um, the, the moniker of autonomous Marxism as developed by Harry Cleaver very often um, uh, the, not Cleaver himself, but the readers of Cleaver have been remiss and have ignored the fact that both the feminist struggle has functioned autonomously in wages for housework and elsewhere, and the black liberation struggle has, uh, has uh, functioned autonomously from the larger class struggle. And very often the concept of autonomous Marxism uh, as described, especially in American academia and very often in predominantly white uh, anarchist, communist and left movements forgets these other elements. Um, so after that bit of commentary, I want to return to that central question. Uh, why is this indebtedness important? Why is it important that we continue to return to this question of Black liberation, of James, uh, that Jimmy and Grace 
uh, asked so clearly. And of course, as Nico's book uh, draws from the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, Detroit Revolutionary Union movements, why is returning to that question of Black liberation important, um, not just for historical accuracy, but for this moment? And I'll just put that out there to the panel. Let them. Uh, if I could jump in. Um, yeah, that's a great question. And I think it also overlaps with Andrew's point about what does it mean in this moment to think about the relationship re reform and revolution, right? The abolitionists um, have really pushed that forward. Um, as I mentioned, you know, for Jimmy and Grace, rebellion was not enough, that there need to be a, a positive way to define revolution. And I think in some ways, um, you know, Black liberation was at the center of their uh, obviously ideas of revolution, they were in sync with much of the, you know, Black Power movement and the anti-revisionist left in the 60s and 70s for that reason. They also at that time were very much in sync with, with the new left in terms of the turn towards Vanguard party building, right? I think what distinguished them was this emphasis though of going beyond the idea of, of production, right? And, and rethinking this whole concept of productive forces. I think I actually want to go back and I could read that quote uh, from the American Revolution. That it's just so central to, to understanding what I was saying is this kind of pithy framework of calling for skipping the stage of socialism and going straight from capitalism to communism, which I think really does distinguish the Bakhtas from, from much of the rest of the Marxist Leninist left. And then eventually, of course, like, like a lot of folks, they, 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 they move beyond the concept of the Vanguard Party itself. But this was uh, from American Revolution. Quote, Marx in the 19th century said there would be a transitional society between the class society of capitalism and the class society of communism. This transitional society, which he called socialism, would be a class society, but instead of the capitalists being the ruling class, the workers would rule. It was this rule by workers, which for Marx would make the socialist society. As the ruling class, the workers would then develop the productive forces, obviously working you know, with the role of the state, to the stage where there could be all around development of each individual and the principle from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs could be realized. Um, and basically they go on to say, this is what makes the class of society possible. But the wrinkle they put in is that under capitalism, the productive forces had developed to where we could already have a class of society, right? That was their point. You don't need the state to organize um, production under socialism to bring the level of productivity up to the point where you could have communism, right? And so that's, you know, again, I don't want that to become sort of a, a dogmatic phrase for party building, right? Um, but it becomes really an important concept to understand why their focus was not on um, the issue of production. And, and it also comes from their critique of consumer society, right? So Jimmy saw this within the plant. He saw, for instance, rising standards of living, important struggles of the working class, but he also saw this sort of corrupting the, not just the union leadership, um, but, but workers themselves. And then they saw the same thing, as, as I mentioned, when they saw the black middle class arising out of, you know, the, the incorporation of, of African-Americans into the system uh, after the black car movement. So that was really their critique of liberal reform. And the reasons why I think, you know, again, I've wrote whole essays on this, citing, citing Emmanuel Wallerstein's work, why I think the age of liberal reform is over and we're in this whole new phase of, of uh, uh, much more uh, uh, much more volatility, I think, uh, in, in the world. But for for Jimmy and Grace, liberal reform was foremost about incorporating people into the system, right? And so for them, revolutionary self determination was about taking that. Uh, means of production into the hands of workers themselves, rather than struggling for, you know, um, a greater share of, of wealth under capitalism, or again, fighting for the, the state to, to, to manage. So there are obviously some together that will still argue, you have to have the state, you know, uh, play this role under socialism for, for Jim and Grace. Again, a lot of it was a subjective critique of the, of the corruption uh, and the authoritarianism that can arise uh, when you centralize the role of the state. Um, but again, it was also this, this corruption under consumerism that led them to break with um, even, I think, much of the new left that was focusing on, you know, the black nation question, the Chicano nation question. It really, for them, self-determination was very much rooted in this more philosophical concept. And I think that's where they come much more in, in dialogue with the autonomous movement. Right. Um, and that's why when they started talking about black leadership and black radicalism in the 80s and the 90s, it becomes much more towards um, the role of African-Americans in the urban farming movement, 
and the cooperative movement in the freedom school movement. Um, Grace talked a lot with Ron Scott, former uh, uh, co-founder of the Black Panther chapter in Detroit about the idea of peace zones or really what abolitionists would talk about, you know, uh, uh, abolishing the, the police and having people take care of their safety and, and security needs themselves. And the last thing she got really into um, towards the end of her life was, was digital fabrication or what more colloquially we would call 3D printing, right? The idea that you don't need necessarily a union to then bargain for a greater share of the wealth and pressure the state to you know, grant more uh, rights and benefits. But that if people could simply have the tools in their hands, and again, obviously this is more complicated than, the, than, than it sounds in theory, tools in their hands to build their own homes, to make their own clothes. If the workers themselves could actually own the means of production, you could organize at a local scale these sort of models of, of com small seed communism or you know, the, the next system. Um, and th that's really what Grace saw coming out of Detroit. This is why you know, sometimes she would talk colloquially about Detroit as the Chappas of the North, linking you know, to the work of the Zapatistas, um, linking to the work of eco-feminists like Vandana Shiva and Maria Mies. Obviously a lot of our thinking was related to the World Social Forum, Ferrari's influence in the Brazilian Workers' Party, horizontalism. These are the kind of dialogues that we had. And then within, within the US, African-American radicals like Robin Kelly um, and then Barbara Ransby and her emphasis on, on the, Ella Baker and the role of, of grassroots uh, democratic organizing. So this is the kind of way in which I think Grace and Jimmy, and particularly Grace after Jimmy passed away, really reframed their radicalism, um, uh, more in tune with the discussions of horizontalism and, and autonomism. And I think that's what's resonating a lot more with the younger generations who were sort of didn't live through the Cold War, didn't live through the cadre organization, party building sectarianism, you know, the 1970s. Um, um, thanks for the question. I mean, it's a very interesting question. I was just um, really pondering about it while Scott was, was talking. Why, why is the question of black liberation important? Why was it important for Italy at the time, but not only Italy, at, you know, it's, in, it, it's an international issue, you know, when, when um, you have um, black militants who travel all across Europe, uh, all across the world, to, because there, there is an audience for them, you know? So uh, why, why is it important then? Why is it important now? And, and I think that the, the answer for me is in the direction because the, the black liberation struggle conf confronts the most kind of powerful liberal capitalist society and forces that society to confront its own contradiction. And, and, that, uh, and, and that confrontation, I think, is very relevant for a number of other countries around the world, which included at that time Italy, but also Today, also, uh, also today, the um, Black Lives Movement has, has a strong resonance uh, in in Italy. I think there is a little bit of a change, though, in, in what I, I mean. If I can look at it from an Italian perspective, uh, in the relevance back then, you know, fifty years ago, I feel it was about tactics and strategies of organizing tools, uh, a certain language. Um, the question of racism itself was not very well understood by, by Italians at the time. When John Watson of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers traveled to Italy and was talking about the racism of the American working class, it, it, was, it was understood by, by Italians. So it, it wasn't a matter of, of uh, borrowing uh, uh, th those tools from the Americans and see what applications could have had in Italy. And obviously, then this course was kind of bouncing back to the US because then when radical America covered the Italian struggles, uh, then there was a sort of mutual influence, okay? But that was the importance back then. I think uh, right now, the, the importance for, for instance, for Italy would be not only a question of tools and, and, and political vocabulary, but also the, the really the, the political agenda itself. Because now Italy is a different country from 50 years ago. It's a country where there is a black population uh, of, you know, of African origin, which is very much a subject of racism. You know, uh, Italy found itself 
uh, 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 discover itself as a as a racist uh, country, as a, as a country where the discourse uh, uh, about who should be included or excluded society uh, is, is, is being really shaped by by the right, and it's been really conservative. So now I would say the political agenda of of the black movement in the US is also important for, for Italy. Yeah, I would just add on that last point that Nico was making, you know, just in my own experience going to Italy in the last 10, 15 years, there's been a really remarkable, I think, um, way in which anti-racism has come to the fore in, in the movements and struggles, you know, around social centers, around displacement and migration. Um, and I think that, you know, um, obviously there was, you know, there was, Southern Italian migrants to the north faced discrimination and oppression in, in a particular way that that you know scholars have debated um, at length to to what extent this is um, you know a form of racism, but I but I think that um, I think that the the struggle of migrants today uh, has taken on you know this sort of catalytic role uh, among movements, especially in Southern Europe, and so I you know I think that that's a, another interesting way that we can think about these resonances across. Um, across time and space. Fantastic. Thank you all for addressing that particular prompt. Congo wanna to move to um, a, a, a neighboring issue, but certainly uh, an important one. Um, holding in my hand a copy of the American Worker pamphlet. Um, Obviously, Grace Lee Boggs contributed to this under her party name, Rhea Stone, and then an American auto worker uh, credited as Paul Romano, but in fact, Phil, Phil Singer, uh, in fact, uh, wrote the first section. So the first section is really a reflection on life in the factory. And then second, of course, uh, Grace uh, addresses the reconstruction of society. There's a central tension in, the, in this pamphlet, and I think uh, speaks to our contemporary moments and some contemporary left questions in an interesting way. Um, but to address that best, I think no one says it <laughs> the way that I could. And Marty Glaberman in the introduction, the published uh, original published edition was 1947. Of course, it was then republished in 1972 by Glaberman's uh, press uh, and effort. And as uh, Andrew um, uh, very well said, this was translated into French and then into Italian and clearly had a major influence on the French and Italian left and workers movements of the time. Um, but Glaberman notes here, the pamphlet appears as two contributions side by side, that of a worker and that of an intellectual. This was viewed at the time as a pamphlet, oh, I'm sorry, this was viewed at the time that the pamphlet was first published as a necessary weakness. The fusion of the worker and intellectual into one totality as in a popular working class press had not been achieved by any Marxist group. But at the same time, that the American worker was evidence of this separation. It was also evidence of an attempt to overcome this separation, if only in the formal placing of the two articles side by side. And I think it's important to note that both in the marriage uh, intellectually and, uh, uh, and in love, of James and Grace Lee Boggs, you see this tension in the ongoing conversations in the left. Do we simply need um, political and theoretical interventions uh, or do we need simply to circulate ideas of struggle and somehow naturally will um, you know, seed new struggles elsewhere? We've seen in the last two years clearly with Black Lives Matter and other kind of um, working class developments and movements in Amazon and elsewhere, a real resurgence of this idea of circulation of struggles and taking place. Um, at the heart of this pamphlet, at the heart of all the interventions of uh, Jimmy and Grace, of the Italians and the like, is this tension between um, the intellectual and the worker, or maybe said better, the tension in between, do we inquire into movements to circulate those struggles, or do we actually directly intervene them to kind of steer them and provide some kind of stability for some spontaneous organizing? Um, so I kind of want to return to this question, maybe just briefly with the three of you. Um, how do we start to resolve uh, this separation that exists on the left? How in the work that you all done and the figures you've studied, do you think about the separation and then, of course, uh, new ways of combining uh, intellectual work uh, and organizing of intervention and inquiry. I have some thoughts, but I'm happy to let someone else go first this time. 
I think you should lead us off, Scott. Okay. Well, I, I think this question of the relationship between, it's really, you're posing what is the relationship between theory and practice, right? And it's absolutely essential. I mean, just to all analysis, particularly, I think, to, to Marxist or radical um, analysis. Um, and it's really, I think, particularly something that, that the U.S. left has, had, has struggled with uh, for a long period of time. I mean, I work as a professor. Certainly, you know, the ivory tower is the center of theory <laughs> without practice in some ways, even people that claim to be quite radical, right? But now we've got this whole, you know, Twitter, social media area where people, you know, ideas can take off in, in, in such a, uh, a way that's completely, you know, I think divorced from actual practice. Um, and this was basically, you know, the reason why Mao wrote on practice <laughs> during the long march. Um, in the 1930s, the intellectuals have been uh, stuck with their dogmatic ideas only from books, um, but sometimes the activists and their critique of, of the intellectuals were stuck at the level um, of, oh my gosh, what's the word? <laughs> um, it's not pragmatism, um, somebody help me. <laughs> uh, begins with an E. <laughs> Anyways, um, um, empiricism, sorry. Uh, that they are, they're, they're not able to transcend their limited experience, right? Or is that one phrase goes, when a frog is in a valley, looks up and thinks the sky is blue, but doesn't see the whole sky, right? I think this is really where we're, we're still at because we've had this division, right? Between theory and practice and so long. And because, um, you know, I've been kind of sort of reading into the history of the New York intellectuals and there's some examples of, of public intellectualism, right? But then there are also so many limits to it. But there's just so many ways in which um, U.S. Uh, higher education has become so divorced, right? To be an intellectual, be a professional, is just to be divorced from struggle, right? And, and movement building. Um, and probably there are places like, like Italy that have much more of a, of a tradition than that that we need to learn from. Um, I think for, for, for Jimmy and Grace, obviously you pointed out, right? That this was really essential it was essential for Grace her whole life to be grounded in struggle, you know, and not to work um, as a professor. Um, and I think ultimately uh, their concept of theory and practice is captured in, in Grace's idea of visionary organizing, that the ideas must inform the work that people need to read, that the, that the reading needs to be accessible. It shouldn't be done, you know, in a, in a purely academic way. Um, and that the ideas must draw out of the most advanced work, right? So we think about reform revolution is you use the reform struggles to attract those that that best practice the the you know the party party line, and then you recruit them into the party based on you know um, in some ways a form of you know um, whatever um, indoctrination into the party dogma. Um, but for 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 Grace, it was very much about these grassroots struggles from these outsiders in particular, representing the best form of creativity, generative uh, um, creativity as generation, but also creativity as imagination, right? And it's through those models that happen from the bottom up that then we could replicate uh, uh, more advanced forms of practice. I, I think you, I think I saw Adrian Marie Brown is one of the speakers in Red Me. I think she in very many ways embodies that, that emphasis on, on creativity, self-activity, um, as, as a form of local local radicalism that, that that then can be that can spread horizontally. And if I could jump in, um, I would say that you know that also rhymes with with much of CLR James's sort of approach, right? This sort of boundless confidence in the creativity um, of of the working class, right? And I think that you know one of the ways that that this you know these if I can say this tradition, I don't know, but um, certainly the Operaisti in Italy in the '60s were interested in. Um, was reconceptualizing the relationship between um, not just theory and practice, but for them more specifically strategy and tactics, right? And I think that, you know, in some ways this is a reduplication of the same problem, but um, if, you know, historically, traditionally, um, the party was seen as having the strategic perspective, the long-term vision of where things can go uh, or where things ought to go, and, um, and the workers themselves uh, only embodied tactical perspectives, right? Um, you know, how precisely you might be able to shut down production in a certain unit of a certain factory. Uh, Tranti said, what if we flipped that, right? What if we thought of, um, what if we thought of the working class possessing sort of spontaneously, right? Imminently to itself, this 
long-term strategy of refusing to collaborate in capitalist development, of refusing to be um, handmaidens to you know, their own servitude, however poetically we wanna put it. Um, and what if we thought of, of, of organization, right? Today, I, I don't think it would be correct to say the party, although you know, there are still um, party forms. Um, but what if we thought of organization, um, of the role of militants, perhaps of, of intellectuals of a certain caste, if not the sort of ivory tower uh, that, that Scott was, was mentioning earlier. But what if we thought of, of organizations as providing uh, tactical support or tactical sort of um, uh, ingenuity, right, maybe. Um, and I think that, you know, in some ways that's an obscure formulation, you know, it's maybe a philosophical proposal rather than always a practical, helpful uh, thing to, to use in, in, in moments of struggle. Um, but, you know, I think Sergio Bologna's form you know, formulation of talking about intellectuals as service providers to, to movements is really helpful, right? Not as, um, as those who kind of can divine the, the perfect trajectory of a movement and make um, all of the correct suggestions, but as those who put themselves, put, you know, make themselves disposable, available to, to the movements um, and circulate information, right? Um, those of us disposed to reading and writing, maybe translating, um, you know, we, we have access to, to sort of um, transnational, um, you know, networks and ideas that, that can be extremely useful um, if brought to new contexts, you know, that, um, and so I think, I think it's exactly right what Scott was saying that, you know, we, we still find ourselves um, struggling with this sort of challenge in the United States, especially such a, you know, kind of anti-intellectualism is so, still so rampant in the United States, I think is, is relevant too. Um, and I'll stop there, sorry. Uh, also, just very quickly, I wanted to, to interject. Um, thanks, Kevin, for, for mentioning that the structure of that book, uh, 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 booklet, The American Worker, uh, because um, it, it's probably uh, difficult to recognize now, you know, uh, the, the, the impact that uh, th that new kind of format of a dialogue um, or, or book based on a dialogue between a worker and intellectual uh, had on, on, on the landscape of, of, of uh, left-wing uh, um, uh, activists. Um, and it's not only that book, there are a number of other um, books uh, produced by the uh, John Forrest tendency, which are also following that format. And obviously, as, and as, I think particularly Andrew would know very well, then in Italy, this is translated in, in the practice of the so-called co-research, uh, which is uh, even it, it's the same idea, but brought, I think, to new level of sophistication, because what happens is, is, is intellectual going to the factory, researching with the workers, uh, the conditions of work, but also um, drafting together a political project, rather than coming with certain kind of fixed ideas or what that political project should be, and then trying to kind of persuade or influence uh, the workers, which was the kind of the communist way of organizing uh, in the factory. So I, I would say, first of all, that's a great legacy of, of that transnational movement for us. You know, the workers inquiry know in details with you know and with an open mind, research who the workers are, what they're doing. What is their relation to technology? What are their identities? And then start to formulate uh, a strategy. Um, yes, you wanted to inter interject, Scott? Just wonder if I could just, oh, no, yeah. go ahead, finish your point. But no, please go, go ahead. Yeah. Just wanted to say a really quick thing, make sure this doesn't pass, uh, especially this moment. You know, Grace didn't talk a lot about the American worker or, or, or some of those pamphlets. And it's not that she wasn't proud of the work she did in Johnson Forest. But I think what's really significant is that she was doing all this work very much under, under collective decisions, but under sort of decisions made by someone other than herself, right? So she was briefly involved in the Asian American movement in the 60s, which is about rejecting the model minority, which was about, you know, asserting the, the place of Asian Americans within radical organizing. Um, but this is something that she had really suppressed through much of her time, right, in the movement, because she wasn't black, because she wasn't working class. And I think at this moment, you know, I think she would really be stressing the important role of her identity as Asian American and Asian Americans in sort of revolutionary and radical movement base. I just wanted to make sure I, I didn't let that go um, without saying. Thanks, thanks, Scott. And I'm really 
I, I'd like to know more about what you know about Grassley Vox, but that's not for another time. I just want to mention the other, the other thing that came to my mind is that, especially for those of us who are located within academia, I mean, I think there are two kind of contrasting forces there. One force is, is the fact that from the 1970s on, uh, there, and, and thanks to the social movement and thanks to the people we're talking about, academia has, uh, um, uh, uh, has taken on board new research methodologies, which are more participatory. You know, there is you know, participatory action research, which is there to, you know, to change a community. Uh, so these are now, there are ways of researching which are legitimate even in academia and can, uh, can be used to work uh, with uh, with uh, social actors, with you know, with workers, other other political subjectivities. This goes against though, another tendency, which is the the, um, the, the increase uh, um, forwardism within academia. You know, the increase uh, uh, level uh, uh, amount of work, uh, amount of exploitation uh, that uh, hardly leaves the time uh, to you know to. To dedicate yourself to those kind of projects, which are by definition they need time because they need, they need uh, you know, dedication, frequent interactions, and so on. Uh, so I see this tendency, which are a bit uh, opposite to each other, but are an obstacle uh, overall to to that kind of uh, uh, connection between intellectual workers. Wonderful. Thank you all. I want to turn now to a question that was provided by one of the audience members. And I think it's very in tune to where uh, we've been heading uh, during this entire session. Clearly, the idea of workers' inquiry is to understand and then circulate the struggles that are currently taking place on the ground. And we want to be grounded in those struggles, as uh, Scott uh, so well commented in regard to Grace's work and orientation. So what does that mean for now? And what does that mean in regards to the current struggles that are circulating in the United States and across the planet? And the question that came in was specifically for Scott, very clearly addresses um, Nico and Andrew's concerns and scholarship and ideas as well. So I'll read this directly. For Scott, but anyone can respond. What elements uh, of your analysis in the next American Revolution do you find most important the struggles over the last year from Amazon workers and gate worker strikes to the George Floyd rebellions? So really maybe we can begin with Scott and then open it up to you, Nico and Andrew. From your scholarship, from your ideas, from this work, um, what is most important to those struggles? Yeah, so um, I think in a prior era, really up through the 1960s, but in, in some ways living in the aftermath of it, so many struggles were about reform within the cap liberal capitalist structure. Right. And then again, like I said, the way to promote revolution was to engage workers or oppressed peoples in those reform struggles and then to do the kind of study groups and revolutionary studies that, that would recruit the, the, the most advanced strata into the party or the revolution organization. What's different now is when we look both at, you know, the authoritarianism, the Republican Party, the emphasis on voter suppression and white nationalism um, is a rejection of that liberal model of reform. And you're seeing a similar thing on the left with a rejection of what I'll just loosely here call the politics of recognition. People want to know more about that. I've written about this. Um, and so, you know, in Detroit, this is really symbolized by this neoliberal takeover of the city itself under emergency management uh, and bankruptcy, really to just impose a model of voter suppression, gentrification, neoliberal dispossession, privatization, and so on. Um, and so I think that really what that stresses is uh, we're back in a moment where we need to see that the protest against the existing order is justified and necessary. The rebellion against the order is necessary. But it's not like there's a body, a bipartisan body that's prepared to reform the system, even to make it a little better or to address these demands and concerns, right? So it's really the impossibility of the system resolving its crisis. The internal contradictions have reached the point where, as, as Wallerstein said, you know, the, the ultimate issue is how are these struggles right now anticipating us moving towards a better, more democratic system or a worse, more oppressive, repressive system? Yeah, I just off the cuff, a couple thoughts. One is, um, again, I'm just returning to Tronti because this is the sort of way I've you know, come into this lately, um, but I don't mean to make everything in relation to him. Um, but 
you know, he has this discussion of extremism and reformism in the late 60s. Um, and he defines reformism as the worst kind of utopianism, right? This notion that the capitalist state can be reformed in order to um, actually provide like a long-term uh, solution to the contradictions of, of capitalist development, worker struggle, et cetera, is, is precisely a utopianism, right? And um, I think that speaks to part of Scott's point. Um, you know, uh, the, the different fractions of the capitalist class and different uh, strata of state managers have proven pretty incapable of implementing uh, intelligent reforms that would, you know, prevent insurgencies. Uh, I think, you know, we're every, every day, this is, this is changing. And I think um, from my vantage point, there, there does seem to be a new unity between um, certain fractions of capitalists and those with their hands on the levers of, of government power in Washington. Uh, there does seem to be a new unity, perhaps only temporarily achieved, um, but, but nothing about that is permanent. And this is actually what Tranti refers to as extremism, which is the notion that uh, the state and, uh, and the capitalist class are in perpetual lockstep, right? With, with their plans always being carried out successfully. And um, you know, he, he has other thoughts as well about that. But I think that it's important for us to keep in mind this notion of capital and, and the capitalist state, um, you know, uh, having a precarious unity that, that movements can help to destabilize, right? That movements can help to separate. And so perhaps one of the things we can think about, again, it's long-term maybe, or, or sort of uh, abstract, but can we in this moment divide capital from its state? What would that even mean? Um, you know, and how does that relate to autonomy? But I know I'm posing questions when I you know, we should be wrapping up pretty soon. So thanks for the questions. I just wanted to, but I, I, I'm not sure I understood the question um, precisely, but, um, just thinking about one tool of that epoch, um, which was considered by you know, Italian um, workers, which could be useful maybe in the American context right now. And I'm thinking uh, one thing that comes to my mind is, is um, the focus on, which wasn't, um, so this is something that wasn't, uh, um, on which social movements and radical group did not agree overall, but it was, uh, I think, uh, supported by, especially by Potero Peraio, the uh, workers' power uh, movement in Italy, which was the focus on, on the salary, on the wages. And, um, and that's because usually the focus on wages is seen as rather a kind of reformist goal of you know, getting better wages. Uh, but they saw, uh, as, as far as I understand, and, and, and I'm wondering um, and later maybe Andrew we can discuss in another occasion, uh, they saw it as something that if you push farther enough on that point, you go there and uh, and, uh, and 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 kind of chip away uh, a lot of of uh, the capitalist um, power uh, to control politically the labor force. So the the, the fight on wages. As a kind of key focus to you know, to break down the system and to move on to something then radically different, even if originally that might be seen as a reformist goal. Fantastic! Thanks to you all. I'm going to move toward uh, closing the session, and I think, uh, as reflected in our comments today, and really in the last. Um, year of pandemic and struggle, it's clear that the Black liberation movement uh, continues, right? That struggle clearly continues. Another uh, point I think that has been quite made clear over this last year is that work is still the central issue, right? The struggles of Amazon workers, of gig workers, of essential workers simply to survive in the midst of a pandemic, that work and access to work, to wages, even through uh, the quote unquote um, state apparatus provision of welfare is still a central issue. Um, and we'd be remiss today if we did not comment on Mother's Day and how unwaged reproductive labor is still a central issue. If labor power is essential and most important commodity for the production of surplus value under capitalism, then in clearly the reproduction of labor power predominantly by women and gender nonconforming peoples, which are done without wages. And then of course, we've seen a wage sector develop that's mostly racialized and of immigrant labor, especially here in the global North. We'd be real remiss if we don't comment. And of course, continue those conversations uh, throughout our day, and of course, into our movements. 
Wanted to take the moment to thank uh, Common Notions for hosting and organizing. And of course, our comrades at Red May who are integral to having this conversation, of course, many others. Want to call folks' attention who are watching this to the event taking place on May 13th at 6 p.m. Um, uh, Stephen M. Ward and others um, will be speaking about James and Grace and their lives. And clearly, those interested in this panel would like to continue and, of course, have that conversation therein. I want to take a moment to plug one more additional event with Common Notions on Tuesday, May 21st at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. You can find out more at commonnotions.org or our Facebook page and the like. We're going to be hosting a panel called Green May, Red May, Ecological and Worker Struggles After the Plague Year. And um, joining us for that will be historian Peter Leimbaugh, uh, activist and scholar Eleanor Finley, and then two uh, collectives who produced recent work on common ocean, Counter Power and Out of the Woods. I'll have the pleasure of facilitating that as well. And once again, please uh, support um, Red May's efforts to continue bringing these talks to you and appreciate you all uh, participating and listening. And these conversations, of course, as I noted in the onset, will continue um, after this into other Red May events. And I look forward to speaking with Nico, Scott, Andrew, and others about these questions in the future. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks a it's lot. to be here. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, Kevin and, and Nico and Scott and Andrew uh, and Malav and everybody who made this possible. And uh, this conversation will continue in, in various forums that have different names this week, but it's the same conversation. Uh, so I want to uh, just end by saying uh, we're taking a two-day vacation, but we'll be back on Tuesday at 11 a.m. with Class Power on Zero Hours, the Angry Workers Collective. So uh, there's more there on this subject. So thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you soon.